I'm incredibly excited to be speaking to all of you today about ECMAScript 6, the next major revision of the standard that governs JavaScript, along with some other programming languages. So let's go ahead and get started. At W3Conf, one of the things I said was that every technology had a story behind it. And this particular worldview was imparted upon me by Farouk Atas. About a year ago, I was watching him speak at HTML5 DevConf, uh, as it turns out. And um, so Farouk is the modernizer, is the developer of Modernizer. He is also a, an amazing open web advocate. And one of the things, and his uh, presentation was about the beauty of constraints and specifically embracing them in software design. And the way that he presented it in this type of frame story was particularly engaging because a lot of times when you see a particular technology, the only context you have is the final product. You don't necessarily have the story that's surrounding it. You haven't seen all the decisions that made to the that resulted in the way that that technology was designed. And a lot of times, it's very difficult to be able to grasp why we have a particular version of a feature or why something ended up being the way it did. And without uh, having this frame story, very few decisions make sense. Now, ECMAScript 6 has had a very long and torturous road that I'll cover before we delve into some of the features. And it's not been without its fair share of controversy. There are developers who have wanted to get started with ECMAScript 6, but have a few qualms either about the syntax or about some of the features. And without understanding the story, who can blame them? It's very difficult, I think, to be able to, make an, to step back and make an objective assessment about the value of a feature when you don't have the, the full context for its emergence. And so what I wanted to do today was to briefly cover how ECMAScript 6 became the language that it is today and some of the interesting challenges that it's faced on, along this road. We'll then proceed with a deep dive into some of my favorite parts of the language. Now, the talk is titled ECMAScript 6, The Refined Parts. And I think this idea of refinements is very key to the next iteration of language. There are a lot of major features in it, everything from classes and modules to entirely new syntaxes for doing the common operations that we as programmers work on every day. And I wanted to step back um, and give some of these smaller features, some of the highlights. Because features like classes and modules, I think either many of you have heard of, or they're going to receive the most coverage as soon as they're released. And so what I wanted to do today was to showcase some of those features that might not be that world changing at first glance, but that will nonetheless make it a lot easier for you to write bits of code that you do. So JavaScript by itself, is by most accounts the world's most popular programming language. Because every browser made today, uh, and certainly all the major browsers, ship with a JavaScript interpreter. And the barrier to entry for it is incredibly low. All you need to do to get started with JavaScript is just open up the dev console and begin typing away. And thanks to the recent uh, incredible growth in the front end tooling community, there are a it's easier than ever to get started building apps of increasingly complex scale. But JavaScript isn't just for the front end anymore, of course. Node.js has, has completely changed the applications of JavaScript on the server as well. And Node has a wide variety of uses. You can use it everything from tooling to uh, ru uh, rudimentary chat servers or your typical HTTP servers, and now build databases a la carte thanks to the LevelDB movement. So JavaScript is incredibly versatile. It's everywhere. How are we going to move it forward? Because we can't break backward compatibility with some of the existing standards, with some of the existing code that's out there today. We've tried doing that in past efforts, and the results haven't been good. So ECMAScript 6 is an attempt to learn from some of those mistakes as well, and to focus on getting some of the refinements right so that developers can continue using the code that they write today and not have to worry about it breaking when a new edition of language comes out. So let's begin with a story. Our story starts in 1995 with an engineer at Netscape Communications Corporation named Brendan Eich. Uh, Brendan Eich was tasked with uh, developing a new client-side scripting language to complement the latest and, and greatest technology that Sun built at the time, which was Java. Now, Java was perhaps the best way to create interactive immersive experiences. Again, 1995. 
but Java code, Java applets, didn't mesh very well with the remainder of the page. They could perform some basic introspection into their environment, but they didn't have access to every element on the page or, or um, have any type of meaningful interactivity with them. Uh, similarly, for small bits of interactivity, so in, uh, say, menus or basic client-side validation, it was simply unreasonable to expect that users would wait while the while your browser downloaded a Java applet over a 28.8 bit dial-up connection, again, mid-90s, and then wait for the Java plugin to kick in and for the Java runtime environment to start up. That wasn't the way that developers were going to do things. But at the same time, this allure of having Java as a write once, run everywhere language was very appealing. And so it was important to have a client-side scripting language to complement that. Now, uh, Brendan named his original creation LiveScript. It was subsequently renamed to Mocha, and then in a last-ditch attempt to capitalize upon the marketing surrounding Java, it became known as JavaScript. And we've, been, we've all been confused by the name ever since. Now, JavaScript, though, quickly eclipsed its uh, distant and rather confusingly named cousin and was then picked up by Microsoft and implemented in the latest iteration of its browser, which at the time was Internet Explorer 3. But because there was no definitive specification for JavaScript at the time, Microsoft did the only thing that any good engineering company would invariably do. They reverse engineered Netscape's implementations. And without that formal spec, of course, different key differences arose. And about a year later, in 1996, Netscape, Microsoft, and a consortium of other companies stepped forward and decided to submit the version of JavaScript to the ECMA, the European Computer Manufacturers Association. And the result of this was the emergence of a standard called ECMAScript. Now, nobody had particularly cared for the name ECMAScript. Uh, uh, Brandon Eich was once known to refer to it as that it sounded like a skin disease. It was, an, it was really this uh, verbose, tedious trade name that was only used to protect against uh, trademarks and to have some kind of distinguished name for the standard. But nonetheless, uh, JavaScript and JScript continued to evolve and emerge, and soon there was a second edition of the language that was published primarily for uh, bringing it into compliance with exi existing international standards. But things became interesting in 1999 with the emergence of the third edition of ECMAScript. Now, it included features that today we'd find, today we couldn't think of JavaScript without them. Things like regular expressions or try-catch. Before this point, exception handling JavaScript was easy, meaning that there wasn't any. If your script threw a runtime exception, your browser would stop executing it. That's it. There was no granular exception handling. Things like the instance of operator, uh, additional loops, uh, array and object literals. These are all fundamentals that we would consider that we would be, we couldn't write our JavaScript applications without them. And, and ECMAScript 3 was also built to anticipate future growth with an upcoming fourth edition of the, of the standard. But things didn't quite work out the way that the ECMA had intended. In late 2004, early 2005, the ECMA, the uh, working group responsible for innovating the language within TC39, within the ECMA, named TC39, just short for Technical Committee 39, had decided to attempt to assimilate some of the features that Macromedia had developed in its dialect of ECMAScript called ActionScript. So whereas JavaScript was a relatively conservative departure from ECMAScript, again, primarily due to the naming and some uh, Netscape and later Mozilla-specific extensions, ECMAScript really extended the JavaScript language in several key ways. It introduced classes and modules, packages, namespaces, optional static typing, type annotations. And this doesn't really look like the JavaScript that we write today. So what happened in between there? Around in late 2005, there was, there was a movement that would change everything on the web, and this was Ajax. Suddenly, with the emergence of libraries like Prototype, Dojo, MokiKit, Rico, name, many names which have since gone by, it was very easy, suddenly, to build complex interactive apps. That's not to say that developers hadn't been building these kinds of applications before, but rather that at this point, it became mainstream. And with the incredible growth in the JavaScript community at the time, it was in, an incredibly difficult proposition to go to developers and say that in a year's time or in two years, the code they were writing would break. 
ECMAScript 4 was not intended to be backward compatible initially. In fact, some of the key, one of the key goals of the language was to uh, fix some of the issues that had cropped up in the past. But now, with, with developers continuing to build existing code on top of it, it really wasn't practical to create a backward incompatible version of the language. So ECMAScript 4, the, the proposal was eventually canceled. The only hint of it is um, looking at the various specification versions and seeing that there was no ECMAScript 4 released on um, the ECMA's website. In fact, there is no official specification floating around for it because it was never finalized until that point. And the technical committee went back to their drawing board and decided, how do we innovate the language, but in a way that's backward compatible and in, with the code that developers are writing today? And so in 2009, uh, they released the fifth edition of the ECMAScript standard. The fifth edition was a relatively conservative departure from the third edition. It provided some nicer uh, syntax for getters and setters, the only major syntactic edition that wasn't a codification of an existing de facto standard. It provided some object reflection methods, array extras that had existed in Firefox since Firefox version two. So not a lot of particularly interesting surface changes. But under the hood, it tightened down a lot of internal semantics. It became a much more precise, strict, and unambiguous standard, on top of which the TC39 could continue to innovate and build other language features. And that brings us to where we are today, in 2013. Into the ECMAScript 6 specification is scheduled, for, is scheduled to be released by the end of this year, in December, and it has a lot of features in it. But if you look at this list, a few of the features jump out. Things like classes, modules, block scope, iterators. A lot of these features did make their debut in ECMAScript 4, in the canceled fourth edition. But whereas previously, there were nice to have features that could be assimilated from other other languages, now there's been an eye toward making them mesh very well with existing code that developers are writing. The technical committee looked at a lot of, look at the common patterns that developers are using and tried to figure out what are some, what are some solutions that would best be adopted at the language level. And so what I'm, and a lot of these, we, we don't have time today to cover nearly all, of, all these features in detail. But I wanted to give you just a quick introduction to them so that hopefully you could see a feature that strikes you and you might find a way to use it in your application. The goal here is to provide some practical syntax that you can get started with today. And we'll go ahead. And the other point, of course, of ECMAScript 6 is to build a foundation for future versions of the language. ECMAScript 7 has a lot of features planned for it, things like a rethinking of the concurrency model of the language, as well as features like object.observe. Now, these features are ones that would still be fantastic to have in the current iteration of language, but there just wasn't enough time to build them. Right? It was, TC39 needs to get this version of the specification out the door so that developers can start using these new features. And then at a later time, once the proposals are finalized, subsequent versions of the language will be released. So ECMAScript 6 is both a codification of existing patterns and a platform that continues the trend by ES5 to allow, to allow future innovations in the language. And we'll go ahead and begin by starting to talk, uh, starting to talk about generators, which are an interesting pattern and that tie nicely with the theme that will be furthered in ES7 with uh, the new concurrency model. A generator is a form of a coroutine. So what's a coroutine? A coroutine is nothing more than a construct that allows you to suspend and resume execution of a particular function at multiple locations. Now, it's important to note that suspending does not mean blocking. I think and there's been uh, some misconceptions about looking at this and seeing that a generator will automatically block your code so that nothing else can run. And that's actually not the case at all. It's a generator is, generators have three multiple, uh, three patterns that you should know about. There's the new yield statement, which suspends execution of the function. There's a next method that the resulting generator object has that allows you to resume execution. And then there's a throw method that allows you to propagate an exception to the parent function and have it be thrown at the position of that yield expression. So we'll go ahead and begin by looking uh, at generators through a simple Fibonacci sequence example. Um, how, uh, how many of you know Angus Kroll, 
or have followed some of his blog articles. Okay, there is a fantastic series that he's written about if Hemingway wrote JavaScript. And he covers how various uh, famed literary figures would tackle uh, writing the Fibonacci function in JavaScript. And this is the generator, this is the uh, plain Jane generator version of that. There are ways that we can make this a bit more fancy, but we'll just look at the basics. So the first thing you'll notice about this function is that we have the regular function keyword, but with an asterisk after it. That's an indication that this function is actually a generator function. The reason we need it is because the yield keyword that allows you to yield a particular value is actually not a reserved word in the current, in ECMAScript 5 and earlier. So there needs to be a way to distinguish a regular function body, which can freely use yield as an identifier from any other uh, type of, from, uh, from a generator function in which this has a special meaning. So you can see that here we're initializing two values, uh, pr uh, two variables, previous and current. This is using an example of the destructuring assignment syntax. We'll cover that in this presentation as well, because it's also one of my absolute favorite features of the language. And then we enter this infinite loop. Now, if, we were ex if this were not a generator function, if we, were, if we were to execute this function outright, what would happen is that our interpreter would, emit, would see this function and set up a stack, set up a stack frame for it, uh, set up any um, an execution context, which could bind variables, and begin executing it. And because we have an infinite loop in it, that function would never stop. Right? It would consume all of your CPU, and there would be no way to get out of it short of either force quitting the browser or uh, killing your process in the case of Node. But a generator is different. A generator indicates to the engine that we don't want to immediately execute and evaluate this function in its entirety. What we do is, we, is the engine will continue executing each line as normal. But then it encounters this yield statement. And the yield statement is meant to, uh, is meant to take the current state of the function, so whatever, in this case, whatever bit of state we want to pass it, and gives it to a resulting generator object. So when we invoke the Fibonacci function, we're not going to get any, the return value that we get is not going to be the final return value. Since it's an infinite loop, or an example of an infinite sequence, there isn't a return value that we have. Instead, what we'll get back is this generator object that allows us to interact with the internal state of the generator. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, those two, that generator object has two interesting methods on it, next and throw. So we're, you, you can also see that there is a way for that function to pass back any state that we want to modify. So uh, if I didn't have this, I have this line saying, uh, d declaring this is reset variable, uh, taking it and then using it to reset the state of the generator if, if the um, parameter that's passed is a truthy value. Now there is no reason, there is no reason for me to uh, need to capture this uh, to capture this information, I could just have a yield statement used directly without any assignment to it. And in that case, the function just continue yielding Fibonacci numbers. But being able to pass back values to the generator is quite interesting, as we'll see soon. So you can see, though, that yield also return, and by allowing us to modify the state of the generator, we can, we, we can use it to uh, follow up some additional patterns. So here's an example of using a Fibonacci function. You see that we get back a generator, and when we call next on the generator, basically to step to the next instruction in the code, we get back this tuple of containing a value property and a done property. The done property is always a Boolean value that indicates whether the generator has finished executing. Because we're in an infinite loop uh, to generate an infinite sequence, the done property in this case will never be true. It'll, it'll always be false because there will always be more items to consume. So you can see that we call next once and we get the value one. We call next again and we get the value two, the third element of the Fibonacci sequence. But then we pass back this parameter called true in it, which is then assimilated by that generator function and bound to the is reset variable. We, because is reset is not a truthy value, this indicates to the generator that we want to reset its state back to the beginning. And finally, there is a way that we can have it throw an exception. Let's say that we give an error object with an exceptional condition. That yield statement will be transformed. You can think of it as that yield statement being transformed into a throw. And then once that exception is thrown, it's propagated until the first, until the first um, uh, catch block that catches it and handles the exception appropriately. 
But Fibonacci numbers aren't particularly interesting, right? Unless you're Angus writing another blog post, or unless you want to write a Fibonacci server benchmark for Node.js, you'll rarely want to use a Fibonacci sequence in your production application. But this ability to suspend execution of a function has some interesting applications. Namely, what if the caller of next and throw could resume execution when an asynchronous function completed? How many of you know what's coming next? No one yet? Awesome. Promises. <laughs> yes. But the point is, is that promises are just one pattern for facilitating programming. And the reason I picked them as an, for, for facilitating asynchronous programming, and the reason I picked them as an example is because a promise is meant to parallel asynchronous code, is meant to make asynchronous code parallel the synchronous variant. And a synchronous function can do one of two things. It can either return a value or it can throw an exception. So, and as you saw with generators, we can either pass back values to the parent generator function or we can have it throw an exception at that current position and have it be caught by a catch block. So the library that I'm going to be using for this example is Chris Cowell's Q library. But that's not the only library that works with generators. If you're using Node, uh, TJ Holichuk, Vision Media, has published a library called Co, which you can look at on GitHub, that's built entirely around generators. And it supports both promises and thunks. So if the concept of promises looks confusing or you just don't want to use it, and there are valid use cases for not wanting to use that pattern, you can still have the benefit of generators and have it return special thunks instead. The readme's are incredibly comprehensive and will, allow you, and will take you through setting up your generator objects. But let's look at an example of using uh, Q to, uh, to um, map asynchronous operations. You can see that, in, imagine that this is some kind of handler, some kind of route handler in our business logic. I'm using the happy.js framework uh, in Node. How many of you have used happy or are familiar with it? Okay, so it's a regular HTTP framework. It um, allows you to, you, you can access the request payload, you can access the request body at, in request payload, and you can have your handler execute uh, some code and then return a response that then gets sent out to the client. So what we're doing here is we're defining a create account function. And at first what we wanna do is let's say that our, our, our post body has two fields, a name and address. And we want to enforce the uniqueness constraint so that an account cannot have, mo so that an account can only be associated with one address. So the first thing we do is we, we call a get by address method. Imagine that account is an abstract model class that we invented. And then we have it, we give it the address, and then we wait for this async operation. Another way to think of the yield keyword in this particular instance is overloading it to mean await. So we have this account object. And let's say that our account object is promise aware. It returns a promise that Q can consume. And then at some point, at, at, at a later point, it retrieves the account model or throws an exception if that, address, if that account was missing. So if the response code is, 40, is not 404, then we want to rethrow it, right? It could mean that a connection, it, it could mean that we had a connection error. It could mean that we passed it an invalid address. There are multiple use cases for that. And then we can have another handler catch it and return a nicely formatted error message to the client. If the response code is a 404 though, that's what we want in this case, because that means that our address is actually unique. So, and at this point, just to confirm, if we did get an account back, it means that we don't, it means that we don't have a unique address and that we need to th uh, throw an error and somehow inform the user that the address is already in use. Now, if we don't have an account yet, then we create it. We create, we construct our model class, we update it with the payload properties, and then we make another yield call that allows us to save the account in the background. Now, remember I mentioned earlier that promises do not that suspending execution does not mean blocking the thread. So we have our handler in this, uh, so we have our route handler in this case, and our server can continue uh, handling other requests and looking up, say in this case, uh, fulfilling other account registrations. And when a particular, and once a request re uh, resolves, we're able to continue executing through this generator function until the end. So 
that was, so that's an example of a program pattern that you can use in your code and that doesn't require you to make significant changes. As I mentioned, with Co, it's very easy to adapt existing programming patterns in Node to make them work. But now let's move on to talking about the collections API in ECMAScript 6. ECMAScript 6 gives you four new collection types, a map, a set, a weak map, and a new one that's been added recently called a weak set. And collections address some of the pain points about manipulating data in JavaScript. Currently, the only two data structures that you really have are arrays and objects, or the two fundamental data structures, on top of which you can build your own abstractions. But the big benefit of using collection is that all of them finally support sublinear lookup times. This means that you can have real sets and real maps that, are, that have any key assigned to any value. Right, the, one of the weaknesses of JavaScript's objects model is that all keys are strings currently, which means that if you wanted to store, you, if you want to associate a key with a value, you would be restricted to using a string identifier, or it would be just cast to a string and then produce unexpected results. So with collections, you get sublinear lookup times of, uh, of, for regular objects. It's, incredibly, it's an incredibly convenient pattern. The other point is that maps and sets have a predictable enumeration order. If you use a foreign loop over a regular JavaScript object, that order is actually implementation dependent. There is nothing guaranteeing that iteration order. So with, we can't change that because we can't break existing behavior with libraries, but we can at least uh, develop new collection types that enforce a particular enumeration order. An example of sets is that you can remove duplicates in linear time. Currently, one of the only way to really have a, a set in JavaScript or to uniquify an array is to construct a new array, iterate over one forward, uh, push elements into your results array, and then every time you encounter an element in that original, you iterate over the results array, so n, n squared complexity, in order to uh, retrieve, in, in order to create a unique set. But because we have real sets now, rather than, using that, rather than arrays that just happen to contain unique values, it's incredibly easy to write, uh, to, to write a function that uniquifies a set in a single line and that accomplishes it much more efficiently. And finally, weak maps and weak sets can use weak references to allow for garbage collection. Maps and sets have strongly held references. So this means that while that object is holding on to a reference for a particular item, it can't be garbage collected. Now this, so this can be painful, say for example, when you're developing an element storage engine. Uh, jQuery's element storage engine associates a, uh, identifies every element with a unique, uh, appends a unique identifier to every key, just to use jQuery as an example and then uses that as a lookup table in an object literal to associate some data with it. The problem is, when that element goes away, that data is kept around in memory. And or if you're just holding on to those references by default, even when you've removed an element from the DOM, there's still that one copy left of it. You're holding a reference to it. And until you either explicitly clear that reference, and until you explicitly clear that reference, there is no way to, for the garbage collector to be able to collect it. So, Let's write a leak-free element storage engine using weak maps. jQuery actually has a clear migration path for this, which is, one, which is one of the reasons why I picked weak maps to use this example, because they work incredibly well for being able to take an object, in this case an element, see if it exists in our weak map, and then assign some storage to it. Now, for our storage engine, we're using a regular map. We're not using a weak map because we want to keep that element data around. So this is an implementation of the store function that allows us, that will allow us to give it an element, some key, which can be any object, remember now that we have real maps, and a value to associate with it. We then make sure that the element is in our storage map and then simply set its name and value appropriately. So we can use the same pattern for retrieving and deleting keys. And again, because we're using a weak map, the once the element is garbage collected, uh, the, the, all of the associate element data for it will be deleted. So you're not uh, leaking memory and preventing your garbage collector from running to collect all these phantom references that you still have references to. So weak maps are ideal for use as a global private data store. You can have a single application or a, nod, or a node module use a weak map to store a lot of private data without incurring any excessive memory usage. But there's another even better solution 
for storing private data directly on an object, and those are symbols. Symbols give you unique private object property names, and they're a memory efficient alternative to the revealing module pattern. Right? If you, uh, today, information hiding in JavaScript isn't very practical. You either need to prefix your um, properties with a leading underscore, which says this property may change later, but does nothing to prevent users from actually using it. Or, it, or you have to use the revealing module pattern and create a closure for every single instance that you create. And that is incredibly wasteful for memory. So now information hiding um, is not necessarily something that's... Information hiding can be important because it allows you to move your public API forward. Right? You can change your underlying API as much as you want. And as long as the public API remains the same, users, code, uh, users can migrate to the latest version of your library and keep using it without being none the wiser that you had any underlying changes to it. And symbols allow you to have that private data so that you can store as much as you need to on your objects and not have to worry about uh, users modifying it in unexpected ways and then encountering issues when they upgrade and their code breaks. To accomplish the use of symbols versus regular strings for keys, the square bracket operator that you would use for um, accessing a JavaScript property name has actually been upgraded to distinguish between symbols and strings. Now, it can't be upgraded to distinguish between strings and any other type of object because there are developers that are relying on that behavior. But symbols are a new type, so we can change it and make this one modification. A good example of this is an OAuth client. Let's say that you're writing an OAuth client implementation. There are three uh, particular bits of information that an OAuth client instance have to, has to keep track of. The base URI, the client ID, also called the consumer key, and, the se and a shared secret, also called the consumer secret. Now, OAuth requests are particularly interesting because every request has to be signed. There's a signature base string that you construct with the base URI and uh, the, token, the token identifier, and then you sign it with a, with a pair of shared secrets. So you don't want users coming in, or you don't want to give this to untrusted code so that it can modify values and then have your request completely fail because you're overriding instance parameters. So what this allows you to do is to have guaranteed private storage. You just store the base URI, the client identifier, and the secret as private names. And here, you construct a new request uh, you construct a new instance of a request object. Imagine that request lives in, its, in a separate file that returns a signed request with the given credentials. So again, it's a, it's a clean way to allow you to attach bits of data to your objects without worrying that users might take it and modify it, come to depend on it, and then you can't ever deprecate it or move your API forward. The next pattern that I'd like to cover is destructuring assignment. Destructuring assignment is one of my absolute favorite patterns, and it's been around since Firefox 2, early 2004. So it's been a long time coming in arriving at this language. And it makes it possible to extract data from arrays and objects using a uh, syntax that mirrors the construction of those objects. Right? So I'll, I'll show you an example on the next slide that illustrates kind of what I mean. The other use case for a destruction assignment is that you can now swap variables without ever needing to incur the use of a temporary variable. So no more var tmp equals a and then swapping b and a. There's no, there's no need to use that pattern. You can also now parse complex structures in a single statement. And this makes it possible for objects to return, uh, or this makes it possible for functions to return complex structures that can then be dereferenced in, in one go. And now it, ma it also makes multiple return values, or things that you would consider multiple return values, either as part of an object array, a lot more meaningful. Right? Previously, if, you, if your function returned an object, you would then have to manually dereference its fields, no longer. And finally, destructuring assignment has a syntax for allowing you to specify default values for arguments. One of the pr uh, previous syntaxes had a feature uh, called refutations. That has been removed from the specification, but default values are a nice compromise or a nice feature that, 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 have, that has made their debut in the end. And you can use this for simulating named arguments. ECMAScript 6 does not have formal named arguments, but you can use this syntax to approximate them. And I'll show you how you can do that. First, some rudimentary examples of destruction assignment. The first one is importing two functions, parse and stringify, from a JSON object. And now, by writing this, so you can see that the syntax here mirrors it quite nice, mirrors the construction of the object quite nicely. 
if you were constructing any other object, you would use the braces and then keys in order to indicate the property names. And now you can dereference them in much the same way. It's very symmetrical. The second pattern shows you an example of executing a regular expression on a string and then pulling those values out. So in this case, we're taking a US style formatted phone number and then matching it on some phone, perhaps one that the user gives us. But we also have a non-participating capturing group uh, at the beginning that surrounds the area code. So the area code is optional. And in this case, if the user doesn't specify the area code, if they just specify a number directly, then we want the area code to default to 415, San Francisco. And this is the syntax that you would use for default assignments. Just uh, provide the identifier with an equal sign and then the default value that you want to use. I should also emphasize that destructure assignment only currently works on objects. So if you try to destructure null or undefined, then or even a primitive, you would have it would throw an exception. Think of how JavaScript works today. If you try to access a property of a null or undefined value, it'll throw an exception. So this the, the same design decision persists. The third example is reversing the order of two parameters. And let's look at the last one. The last one is interesting. This is actually a full function definition in ECMAScript 6 using the new arrow syntax. What we're doing is we're defining a get headers function that takes a node style request object. And there, um, in node, each request object it represents an HTTP request. And it has a property on it called headers that contains those uh, HTTP request headers. So what we're doing in this case is just simply pulling those headers from the function. Again, you didn't necessarily need to write a function for this, but I just wanted to show you how you can use destructure assignment in, as part of an argument. And, for, and now that you have arrow functions, you can create these incredibly compact expressions. So let's look at an, a more complex example to uh, destructuring an entire uh, an entire object of information. Let's say that you get this data back from, uh, from your server. It uh, comes down the wires JSON. You deserialize it, and then you want to print out information about T.S. Eliot's poem, Rhapsody on a Windy Night. So in this case, uh, T.S. Eliot is the first element in our poet's array. The second one is Ezra Pound. We don't care about him for now. But, um, and uh, Rhapsody on a Windy Night is the second element of Eliot's work. So you can see that we have an array of two elements, um, this array contains two objects with a name and works properties, and works is itself an array with containing objects with title and date properties. That's quite a complex nested structure. And you might be, and in current layouts, even though it's very semantic and explicit, you might be tempted not to use something that's this intricate just to avoid having to dereference it when you parse it. But now it's incredibly easy to do that. We have this variable declaration here, and we're dereferencing the first element of our, of our poet's array, in this case, um, Elliot. We're taking the value of the name property and assigning it to the author variable. So the example I was showing previously was dependent on if both the object and the variable that you want to bind a property to have the same name. You can also uh, pull them from different names. So you can take the name property and assign it to an author variable. We're also... Um, Notice that we're also going into the works array. We're using an elision, which signifies that we want to omit the first element into structuring and take the second one, which is Rhapsody. Then we, we uh, then bind that up into a template string. Um, I'll talk about template strings in a bit because they're also incredibly useful features in language. So we're, using this, we're writing out the title of the poem and its publication date and the author. And just like that, in two lines, we've parsed this complex structure that our server has sent us. So it's a pattern that I think will make writing this kind of code incredibly convenient. Also, the default parameter syntax is useful in, a, in an API like node's request module. Node's request module can accept an options argument that has all these different options you can send the request. You can set the method, the query string, the headers, the payload, either specified as a form or as JSON, number of max redirects, whether you use cookies. And these are just the ones that would fit on the slide. There is a plethora of options you can pass to it. But before that, but it can get very tedious to have to reference them from within the function. And writing default uh, parameter and writing default values for every one of these parameters, the method is get if it's unspecified. If it is specified, then use whatever these are passed in. It's madness. Uh, writing that there are 
If, if you use a library like um, lodash or underscore, it has a defaults method that can accomplish this. But now you have a language level construct that allows you to specify default parameters. Uh, you can also see that in addition to providing default object properties or um, makeshift name parameters, we have default parameters. So if you don't specify a, UR, a request URI, it becomes just the empty string. Now, in this case, um, no, uh, the request module will throw an exception when it finds that because the empty string is not a valid URI, but, it's a but it illustrates the example of being able to provide multiple, uh, of being able to provide multiple default values for functions. Again, these are features that other languages have had for some time and that we're now getting in JavaScript that will allow us to make our APIs more expressive rather than so we have to re-implement this code repeatedly in user land logic or have some third-party library handle this. Um, on the line of destructuring assignment, uh, on node destructuring assignment, is also the shorthand syntax. And there are two forms of shorthand syntax, for initializers and method definitions. The first one I wanted to show you is for object initializers. In this example, we have two variables, name and occupation, uh, and then we're constructing an object from them with name and occupation properties that are bound to those, to the variables, uh, uh, to the values of these two variables. But that's a bit redundant, right? We have, we, we already have the name and occupation variables that are sufficiently descriptive and only to have to redeclare them again as property names and as values. That's uh, too much typing. So what we would do is we can cut down on this um, and, uh, and just define a person as containing the name and occupation variables. So the values of these variables will be assigned to the property names, uh, will be assigned to the property values, and the names of these variables will become those property names. So these two examples produce an identical result, but you can see how much it cuts down on, on repetition. The second syntax I wanted to cover are method definitions. And in this example, I'm showing you both a shorthand math definition and some other uh, parts of the ECMAScript API. We already covered template literals. Getters were actually present in ECMAScript 5. I'll, uh, illustrate how, uh, not, I'll, I'll illustrate how the shorthand syntax meshes nicely with them. And we also have a setter syntax that uses a new API method. But let's look at our definition of the speak method. This doesn't look like a valid JavaScript, right? Where's the property name? There isn't one. We also don't have the function keyword. Instead, the uh, function name, in this case speak, serves as, a, serves as an indicator that you want to uh, declare a method. So this syntax works within object literals, and it allows you to cut down on typing. One of the criticisms that JavaScript has received is that despite being a functional language and while allowing to declare object-oriented forms, it's incredibly verbose for both. Right, you have to, you have this function keyword that you need to type out, and if you want to bind a property to a, an object, you have to use that property explicitly and then name the function again. It's, it's needlessly repetitious, and ECMAScript 6 fixes this by giving us this lovely shorthand form. The next two features I wanted to cover work best in unison. First up is spread. Spread allows you to expand the value of an array of arguments without altering the this context. You can think of it as a better function prototype apply. But function apply has some weaknesses. Namely, it can't be used out of the box with constructors. What you have to do in that case is to, create, is to define your own intermediate constructor, call function apply on that, and then it doesn't work on native objects, and it's a mess. So, it now, so we now have a syntax for unpacking an array of arguments and applying it for instantiating, both, uh, for instantiating a constructor or for calling a regular method. It's also a great syntax for merging arrays and array-like objects, as well as casting any object with a length property, an array-like object, into a real array. I'll show you some examples of this syntax. REST is, the, uh, is spread's counterpart. It provides this natural syntax for variadic functions, and it's a nice replacement for the arguments object. Currently, the JavaScript arguments object is array-like in that it has a length property and numeric indices, but it's not an array. You can't call array methods on it. You either have to, you need to convert it into array or just use a regular for loop over it. And arguments can be quite magical. Let's say that you have nested functions. Because, it's a, because arguments is local to a particular function, you can't reference, say, a parent function's arguments variable. So REST allows you to work around that. It also always returns an array, 
even when parameters are omitted. So let's say that you have a uh, function that can accept any number of arguments, and you just don't give it any at all. That was, um, the value of the rest parameter is going to be an empty array, not undefined, not null, nothing that you can't accidentally try to iterate over and then have it throw an exception. Uh, rest is also only valid as the last parameter of function. Uh, if some of you have used CoffeeScript, this might be, this might be rather odd, because CoffeeScript allows you to specify a rest parameter anywhere within the arguments list. Uh, this is primarily done so that you don't have to uh, worry about collisions between rest parameters that need to be soaked up in an array and then optional trailing arguments. So let's look at a comprehensive example that kind of puts all this together. This is a function that takes a node style request object and parses the authorization header as, a, uh, base, as um, basic authentication. So basic authentication is the string basic followed by a space, and then the base64 encoded username and password concatenated with a colon. So what we're doing in this case is we're taking, we're using um, the destructuring assignment syntax to extract the authorization header immediately right in the top of our function. We then uh, parse the scheme and the components. There can only be one component. So, or, uh, so if the scheme isn't basic or you have multiple uh, space separated tokens in that header, then it's invalid. We return null immediately. We then take those components and then in Node uh, decode them as base64 and convert it to a UTF-8 string that we can parse. We then check if it contains a colon character. Contains is a new convenient string method in ECMAScript 6, so no more string index of a value is greater than or equal to negative 1, or using the uh, leading tilde, the bitwise not, to uh, coerce it to 0. So no, no, you no longer need to do that. You have the contains method. You, we then execute a pattern over those credentials, and we use name and password default to the empty string if they're not provided. So we parse this header, and we return this object for us, and then you, you can take that, and your application can then authenticate the user. So this looks very JavaScript-y. Right? There are a lot of syntactic additions to it, but if you were looking at this, you would be able to recognize it as JavaScript. I think this is where a case where ECMAScript 6 really shines in giving you this um, syntax that extends upon existing patterns, but that still retains the familiarity of the language. So the next concept are tag template literals, which you've seen throughout this talk. Uh, ta uh, ta template literals are backtick delimited multi-line strings with embedded expressions within them. And, those, and they're kind of useful because we can pass handlers that can perform additional string processing on it. Now, by default, being able to do string interpolation is kind of useful, right? It's, it, it's nice to be able to not have to do manual string concatenation. But what we can also do is because, we have a, because this handler has access to both the raw string components that were used to build up the template literal, as well as any expressions that were interpolated in them, we can build our own extensible templating languages on top of this. It also makes it easy to do contextual escaping. Now, on this next slide, where I show you a simple HTML escaper, I don't have it be content, uh, it's not context aware, sadly. But what, what we're doing is we have an, our, uh, template, our tag template helper, sorry, has, a object that has an object that we give it, uh, values. It's an array that has a raw property. And then we're soaking up the remaining substitutions, which get, which get passed as variadic arguments. We're then iterating over uh, each raw value, uh, checking to make sure that we're still within the bounds of our substitution, and then interpolating those substitutions. Since this is an HTML escaper, what we're doing is we're taking those, uh, is we're taking one of those substitutions and we're replacing the ampersand, angle brackets, and quote characters. Now, in, in a, this is the rudimentary version of the escape function that's implemented by most popular libraries. And as you can see uh, here at the bottom, we, can, uh, we have an input called name, say some untrusted user input, like uh, containing a script element. And then what we can do is we prefix the handler function to the tag template literal. So that gives us back a string with its contents escaped. And you can use this to build a context sensitive HTML escaper, right? There are different escaping, um, escaping uh, rules for attributes versus element contents. Or let's say that you wanted to allow users to specify some HTML tags, but not others. This can also be incredibly useful if you're writing, if, if you're working with a database that allows you to pass query strings. Um, for instance, uh, at Black Pearl, where I work, we use, the we use the Cassandra database, which uses a query language called CQL. 
So anytime you interpolate query, uh, you interpolate untrusted user data into a query string, you have the potential for injections. In this case, no SQL injections, oddly enough. But Cassandra has a lot of escaping rules as to how, uh, as to how it interpolates those values. And now you can uh, pass in those values, and now you can pass in the input, and then have it be escaped based on the surrounding context. So something that at first glance doesn't seem, uh, tactile seems like a useful syntactic convenience, but it has quite a few broad applications. Another feature is block scope. This is one that I think a lot of us have heard about, that we've been excited about, and that it's one of the uh, more confusing points for people who are first coming into the language. So the fact that var is actually a scope to a particular function, or the global scope, rather than scope to within a block. So block scope with a let and const, which is the constant version of the constant version of let, gives us a real uh, block scoping semantics and gives us real constants. They cannot be reassigned once they've been declared. Let also introduces meaningful semantics for blocks. Currently, you can have a bare block in JavaScript, but it's not very useful. You can't uh, interpret. There, there's nothing that you uh, can accomplish within it that can be done by simply removing those braces. Now that, now that we have let, though, it actually allows us to use those blocks in, uh, in meaningful ways. Function declarations are also now supported within blocks. So it, uh, previously, this was an error in ECMAScript 5 um, and earlier. Now this is a standardized syntax that you can use to effect. So one of the most popular examples to use uh, when introducing people to the problem with, um, the, uh, with, lex uh, with the non lex based code var keyword is this idea of declaring functions within a loop. Right? Because that variable gets hoisted to the containing scope, um, it'll, point, it'll reflect the very last value at the end of the loop. In this case, let's say that we're writing a DOM library and we're defining two methods, get width and get height and we're discriminating on whether to use width or height based on an index, uh, or, or based on the current value of the counter variable. A rather contrived example, but the uh, uh, fact remains that if you were to call get width on it, because width was the first element, which then was overridden by height, remember that variable got, ho uh, that variable got hoisted, it means that both get width and get height will return the height of the element. That's not what you want. And there are various workarounds you can use. You can uh, declare your own closure within the loop, uh, just uh, use an immediately invoked function expression. You can also um, use uh, weird workarounds with with or using the catch block of a try catch statement, just exploiting some semantics in the specification. Those aren't very workable, and they will increase lines of code that you have to write. What's the ES6 solution to this? One change. Change the var to a let. And now you have real box scoping, and get width and get height will return the correct values. That's really all there is to it. So some gotchas with the syntax, though. First of all, you, uh, because blocks now have meaning, attempting to declare a, a let, uh, attempting to declare a let or const binding within a block that within an implicit block is a syntax error. They actually have to be nested within real blocks. Uh, the second example here is a syntax error because we're redeclaring the constant, right? Th and this is what you want. Uh, in s if you try to reassign the value of a constant, things are, aren't quite as explicit. Um, they will, it'll silently fail in non-strict mode. In strict mode, it will throw an exception. So in both cases, you have real constants that immediately alert you if you're trying to do something that you didn't anticipate earlier. Also, the last example is uh, variable, um, variable bindings with the var keyword have to be different from let and const bindings. Uh, you can't declare a variable and have it shadow a constant or, or a, a constant or a let declaration. That will immediately throw a syntax error. And the final bit that I'd like to cover are arrow functions. Arrow functions are a convenient syntax for declaring, uh, uh, for declaring lambdas. Uh, it's something I, I mentioned earlier that one of the criticisms that's been leveled against JavaScript is the fact that for being a functionally influenced language, it has an awfully verbose function declaration syntax. Let's fix that. So in this case, I'm calling the filter method, uh, filtering out the value and then retrieving just the odd numbers from an array of five, uh, five numbers within them. And as you can see, I don't have to put any parentheses around, a, around the first argument. I can just uh, simply declare the value uh, the, uh, the arrow symbol, 
and then the expression. And this expression is implicitly returned. Also, if you have that kind of structure, just a single value expression, you don't have to surround it in blocks. Uh, to show you what you can, though, and this example, a uh, rather contrived one, for which I apologize, uh, illustrates that nicely. What we're doing is we're declaring a function without any parameters, right? Arrow functions can, you, you can only omit the parentheses if you have one argument. If you have no arguments or more than one, you have to provide the parentheses. There's been some discussion in the past as to whether to allow you to uh, use bare arrows directly. So if you don't have any arguments, you don't have to uh, put uh, the pair of parentheses. This function then returns an object. We're wrapping it in parentheses to disambiguate it from the blocks that has a two-string method. Our two-string method accepts no arguments at all, but then has a block that has an explicit return. Right? In this case, the return is implicit. Since we now have a single expression here, we don't have to add the return statement, but it is definitely possible to do that. And in the cases of having a, um, an error function with multiple blocks, it's actually required. And then if we take this object that has a two-string method, and we in, or if we take this function that returns an object with a two-string method and invoke it, we can uh, obtain the value by casting it to a string. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Uh, no. So in this case, we're iterating, we're iterating over the values. So. Mm -hmm. The even number, it's yeah. Filter. Oh, I see what you're asking. Okay, yeah, so we don't need to, zero in JavaScript is considered to be a falsy value. So in this case, any, so in this case, uh, any number modulo two is going to be zero, and zero gets coerced to false. The filter method uh, invokes this function, and then it, um, it uses, it uh, does a simple Boolean cast on the return value. So we don't have to um, explicitly return true or false. We can return something that's falsy, so uh, empty string, zero, null, undefined. Or, um, or we can just have it, or, or we can use the implicit cast. Does that uh, answer your question? Okay. Alrighty. Um, arrow functions are also interesting in that they mirror the semantics of bound functions. Uh, in practice, this means that they're equivalent to calling function prototype bind on a particular method. Um, they this means that they don't have a prototype and they can't be instantiated as constructors. Trying to do that will be a type error. So just something to be aware of in the syntax. So we went incredibly fast today. I'm uh, really sorry for not, not being able to spend more time on some of these or being able to talk about some of the other fantastic features that we have. But I think the thrust of this talk has been that there is something in the language for absolutely everyone. There is a new convenient shorthand syntax to cut down repetition. There's uh, improvements for tooling. There are new data structures. There are improvements to modularity of classes and modules. And there are core refinements. So when can you get your hands on some of these features? Firefox and Firefox Aurora have supported many of these features. In fact, Firefox's implementations since the beginning have been one of the inspirations for ECMAScript 6. They're also available in Chromium and Chrome by enabling the Enable Experimental JavaScript option in About Flags. And now in Node, you can start up Node with the Harmony flag that allows you access to early Harmony features. Uh, a lot of these are, if you're interested in whether particular environments support those uh, features, uh, Kangax, Yuri Zaitsev, has an excellent table uh, of various implementations and the, um, and the features that they support. But there's one more thing. You can't expect your users to be able to uh, enable those external features. If you're targeting toward developers, then yes, definitely. In fact, it's qu uh, quite likely that those developers will have already enabled those external features. And if you're running Node, it's easy to pass flags to your server process. But your user can't navigate to a page and then see that we wanted, to, we wanted to make our experience very good for developers. So, to do, so because of that, we decided to um, only opt into ECMAScript 6, which is reasonable in and of itself. But in order to do this, you have to go through these steps to enable experimental flags. And if you go to about flags in Chromium, there's this big warning at the top that says, enable these at your own risk. And so when users are going to this and, they're, and they see every single indication that they should not be doing this, it's very, very difficult kind of to retain their attention. And they'll probably leave, if it, it, even if they take the time to read 
through, that, um, through the instructions, they'll probably leave once they realize just what it is you're asking them to do. So there are a couple of ways that you can experiment and use a transpiler uh, building on languages like CoffeeScript or TypeScript to compile ECMAScript 6 code or anticipated ECMAScript 6 editions to ECMAScript 5 code. Uh, the first one that I have up here is one that I particularly enjoy. It is not actually a transpiler. It is a virtual machine that's implemented in existing ECMAScript 5. So it provides a full runtime that allows you to experiment with ECMAScript 6. Uh, once you've, if you're, if you're interested in actually taking uh, or writing ECMAScript 6 code and converting it to ECMAScript 5, you can use the excellent tracer compiler that's provided by Google. And finally, if you use Browserify in Node to package your assets, there is a great extension to it called ES6ify that uses Tracer under the hood to compile ECMAScript 6 files and serve them down to the client and in, that's in a syntax that's compatible with existing ECMAScript 5 efforts. Um, I'll be uh, posting these slides afterward as well. So if you uh, haven't caught some, I see some of you trying to write down the URLs. If you haven't caught the URLs here, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be able to post them and you can access them there. So I think at this point, it's in, uh, ECMAScript 6 is growing incredibly quickly, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to, be, uh, to, be able to follow the language as it, as it develops. Now, what are some, if you would like to be involved in uh, watching the language uh, proceed, you can either follow the ES Discuss account on Twitter. It's maintained by Dominic DeNicola, who's been very active in the ECMAScript 6 um, uh, efforts. He's also the author of the Promises specification that I mentioned earlier. You can also catch up at esdiscuss.org. Uh, Forbes Lindsay has built a wonderful front end to the ES Discuss mailing list that allows you to uh, parse some of the messages in detail if you're interested. And on that note, I'd like to thank you all for coming.